Is it great having Missy and the team here leading this worship today? Grateful for her. Little side note, little fun fact. When I was in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, I, led, I led contemporary worship there. I was the contemporary worship leader and Missy was on the worship team. Missy sang with me and uh, sweet having her here. And you know, the secret to my worship leading success in Louisiana was just give her as many songs as possible and get out of the way, do backup. It worked well for me. Hey, good morning. How are you? Everyone doing well? Good to see you. It's always so good to drive onto this campus. I always just anticipate what God has in store and uh, that song, it's always funny to me. These songs grab me sometimes. Like I love that God preaches to my heart before I ever really hopefully preach to yours. And just that, uh, that song, You Make Me Brave, just got me today, you know? I wanna be brave. How many of you wanna be brave? Brave for the Lord. How many of you just, you wanna step so far out on faith? You wanna be so obedient to those places that God is calling you, to those burning bush moments in your life. And uh, my goodness, that's what this is about today. What keeps us from it? What keeps us from being brave? I think a lot of times there's fear that gets in the way. I think a lot of times doubt gets in the way. The good news is wherever you are today, whatever circumstances you find yourself in, whether you feel qualified or not qualified to be a bearer of the good news or the gospel is that God's love, wave after wave, crashes over us in this space. I, I love to see people who have these stories of redemption of how God takes them and, and just takes all the broken places and all of the, the pieces that make sense and that don't make sense and how God uses them for his greater glory. With Missy here this weekend, we're kind of talking about some of the moments, some of the times, those burning bush moments that we shared together. And, and I love this guy in Shreveport by the name of Jamie. Jamie was the, the artist on our worship team. And there were times that you know, when I would preach, which wasn't often because mostly I was leading worship, but I'm thankful to have worked for a pastor that recognized a call and gave me opportunities to preach. And this one particular time I was, I was talking about, you know, doubt, how doubt gets in the way. There's this moment, this disciple by the name of Thomas, right? And, and on the other side of the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples. Some got it. Thomas just missed the invite. He was hyperactive. Maybe he had a little ADHD going on. I don't know, but he missed it. And, and what happened? Thomas is like, look, unless I see it, I just, I don't know how I can hold that, what you're telling me. And, I think Thomas to this day is in heaven going, are you kidding me? I'm known as Doubting Thomas. Like that's my title. That's what they're calling me. I think we all would have done the same thing, right? And what happens? Jesus meets Thomas in the midst of his doubt and he just doesn't grab his ear and spank it or nothing. He doesn't give him a hard time. He just says, listen, Thomas, come on, touch. Go ahead, touch the wounds in my hands. Go ahead and put your hand on my side. So why? Jesus says, so your doubting can stop and your believing can begin. Doubt gets in the way, it keeps us sometimes from seizing those burning bush moments. And I was preaching that message and I talked to Jamie, this guy who had a past and all of a sudden he's, this, he's just a great artist and there are times that when I would preach I'd give him a canvas and he could just in an hour create these beautiful pictures that sort of coincided with what I was preaching. So I'm preaching that passage of scripture and Jamie's over here and he's painting and, and I can't see what he's painting but the people can. It was probably a bad idea. I should have just turned him around, right? And then we could have done the big reveal like the move that bus moment but that was, I just didn't think about it and I could tell as he's painting something was amiss. There was something that was, people were just kind of like staring and leaning a little bit and I don't know. So I'm finished and Missy's singing. I go down in the front and I look at the picture that Jamie had painted and here's this beautiful picture of Jesus and his hands are out and you see the wounds there and I think he, isn't this the sign for like, I love you, sign language, I think? It's either that or rock on, I, I don't know. But it, I know he's, Jesus is doing this and I saw it. When I look at the picture, I figured out what people were noticing because Jesus on his right hand had six fingers. I don't know if that was an accident. I don't know if he was just being creative, if he was saying something deeper. Sometimes artists, I just don't get them. But I know this, I'm looking at a picture and Jesus has 11 fingers. And I'm thinking the service is gonna end and somebody's gonna ask me about that and I have no answer to give them. And the service is over and I'm out in the hallway. I love this memory. And, and like everybody's going through, I'm like, thanks for coming, thanks for coming. No one asked. I'm like, thank you, Lord, except for one guy hung around at the end. And he comes up to me and he says, hey, I gotta ask you something. What's the deal with the 11th finger? <laughs> there it is, right? It's that moment 
World Series. Balls in the air. And I'm like, Jesus, take the wheel. Here we go. And I'll never forget, I just looked at him, real serious, and I just said, you, you're the 11th finger. <laughs> I don't know what to do. This is really cool, though. He looks at me and he goes, bro, and just like hugged me, <laughs> just like wrapped his arms around me, and he walked away. And I gotta say, like, secretly, I kinda hope at some point I'm gonna walk into like Barnes and Noble or, or Amazon, I'm gonna see like an autobiography, 11th finger Jesus, and like his transformation burning bush moment that you realize in all seriousness, it's amazing when you think about the fact that he holds me and all of my brokenness and my weirdness and my flaws and my anxiety and yet in his hands, he uses me to bring about good news. He uses you to bring about good, moves, good news. So I wanna talk today, if you have your Bibles, why don't you open them up and let's go into the, the book of Exodus. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Next week we're gonna jump into the new, but uh, the Lord really kind of led me to, to one of these stories that you find, and I, and I love it. It's the story of Moses, right, in Exodus chapter three. The bulletin um, actually lists a, a bigger context of scripture, and I, I'm not gonna go as far. Sometimes I get really excited, and I wanna preach like five different messages to you, but today, I, like the Lord just stopped me with the story of the, the burning bush. Moses, you know, has a pretty incredible story. If you're familiar with Moses, you know the burning bush is just the beginning. On the other side of the burning bush, he goes to Pharaoh. God says, set my people free. And don't you just kind of think, I mean, we know all of Moses' story. If you spend any time in the church, you know. Well, Moses, we forget, he was living it out real time. So he didn't have like a DreamWorks cartoon that he could watch that would tell him. Um, on Easter, he couldn't watch Yul Brynner and Charlton Heston. I mean, he had none of that. We got that. So God says, go Tell Pharaoh, set my people free. It's not just a one-time thing, but there's multiple times that Moses has to go back. And finally, Pharaoh's heart, it softens. He lets the people go, but there's the moment where Moses hears the horns, turns around, they're coming. There's this walk through the water moment where God delivers his people and God says, I got the promised land for you. But how long does it take for them to get there? A long time, right? It's 40 years of just wandering in the desert, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and when he finally gets there, what happens? Moses strikes a rock, doesn't really do exactly what God says, and there's this moment where God takes him up on top of Mount Nebo. I got to go to Mount Nebo when I was in the Holy Land this summer, stand there, it's beautiful. God says, there it is, there's the promised land. You're not gonna be the one to take them in, but you brought them this far. And God says, and Moses, I'm gonna honor you. I'm gonna be the one to bury you. I'm gonna take you in my hands. It's just this, it's this incredible story of, of twists. <laughs> Talk about recalculating, right? Pick one story in Moses' story. There's like a hundred of them. Twists and turns and roundabouts and all of these different directions. But it all began with a bush. And in the context of that moment with the burning bush, Moses is bringing a lot of stuff to the table. He's bringing a lot of stuff. You know that he was adopted into an Egyptian family, right? He was an adopted son of, of Pharaoh's daughter. So he, he grew up with this idea of privilege. He knew that, but I would say where he had privilege, he lacked identity. And at the age of 40, he's 40 years old, when he actually sees this person, just he, he knew the belittling, the, the burdening of the Hebrew people, and he saw this Egyptian taskmaster, and he kills him, he murders him. Moses kills him. And on the other side of that, he cuts out, he flees Egypt, and he goes to the desert, to Midian, where he stays and he shepherds sheep for 40 years. 40 years, at this point, he's 80 years old in Exodus 3 when he sees the burning bush. 40 years of an identity crisis. 40 years of just sitting day after day after day in the midst of the ordinary, he's just a shepherd at this point, 40 years thinking about the oppression of God's people, his murder, 40 years of seeking out, God, where are you? God, what's going on within the greater context of my life? 40 years breaks down to 480 months. It's 2,080 weeks. It's 14,560 
days. But what I love is where Exodus 3 begins, and it says this. It says, now Moses, I love another scripture, another context, says, one day Moses, <laughs> I love that this is 14,561, because this day is no longer an ordinary day because his eyes are about to be open because the divine in his midst. Now, you know, I always ask questions about the scripture that I'm reading. I wonder, how many burning bushes did he pass over those 14,560 days? Think about that. Do you think he got one a year? Do you think there was a day that the burning bush was over here on the side and Moses is so caught up in the ordinary, he's so caught up in the identity crisis that he had that he missed the greater, the greater moments that God had placed around him? Maybe, we don't know, but praise God for day 14,561. Because the scripture says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, Moses writes Exodus here. Moses is writing his story. He's telling us his story. And I, I wondered when I read this, something struck me. I, I hadn't really noticed it before, that Moses added that he was tending his flock on the far side of the wilderness. Why is that important? Why didn't he just say he was tending his flock? Like, what's the big deal? And I wrote that down, and as I began to dig, as I began to look, I saw that there were a lot of Jewish scholars that were asking the same question. Why did Moses see it necessary to say he was tending his flock on the far side of the wilderness? And you know where the scholars kind of fell? The Jewish scholars kind of met, and they, they agreed that Moses is actually saying something deeper to us all within the context of this. What he's saying is this, that there is no place where God's presence is void. And think about it, right? There's no place where God's presence is void. Like Moses, at this moment, on this particular day, is as far on the other side of the wilderness as he could possibly go, and God was there. Have you ever been in a season in your life where you feel, whether by mistakes you've made, whether by a hurt that someone has given you, whether by whatever kind of identity crisis you have, you feel as if you are on the far side of the desert and God is as far away from you as you possibly could be. Don't you let the enemy tell you that. Greater, don't you allow that to become your identity. I love that Moses says here, I'm as far away in my identity crisis as you could imagine, and guess what? There's no place that God's presence cannot be found. Paul says, nothing separates us from the love of God. David says in the Psalms, you know, there's nowhere we can go that we can escape God's presence. He's there. So on day 14,561, Moses is on the far side of the wilderness and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God, verse two. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. How awesome is that? And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn. So Moses thought, well, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Verse four, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, and he said the words, Moses, Moses. I had another epiphany while I read it this week. God's gonna tell Moses a lot of things, set my people free. Moses, I've got these commands. I want you to write them down. I want you to tell my people these things. God would have a lot of conversations with the divine, but you know where it began? The very first words Moses ever heard was his name. Moses, Moses. Maybe you think in your life, God's not there. He is. Maybe you think in your life that, oh man, there's no way God could ever pull me back. He can. Maybe you think today, man, God doesn't even know I'm on the map. He does. Not only does he know you, not only does he meet you, but he knows your name. I love that. Moses, Moses. And Moses said the three most dangerous words you could ever utter to God in your life 
The three words that if you dare whisper these words out loud, God's gonna say, it's on like Donkey Kong. That's the Hebrew. I don't know if you know that. That's not true, I made that up. Those words, what are they? Here I am, here I am. I love that God says, hey Moses, Moses. There's the test. You got the burning bush that's not on fire. Moses comes over, checks it out. God speaks to him, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am. No matter how lost you are in your story, no matter how far off the map you believe that you are, whether you use Waze or Google Maps, here's what you put in the search engine, here I am, and you watch how God will guide you and lead you. You better expect some wrong turns. You better expect a couple roundabouts, but I'm telling you, when you say it, you utter those words, here I am, God, God's gonna use you in that burning bush moment. And on the other side of that, you've got this. Don't, tell, uh, don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I wonder how quickly did those sandals fly off of Moses' feet? Now, it's interesting that God said, take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy ground. God doesn't say, hey, I'm gonna lead you to the promised land, and when you get to the promised land, flowing with milk and honey, then there's the promised land. That's holy ground. God says, no, no, no. Holy ground is not defined as when you have it all together. Holy ground is defined when you stand in my midst and you recognize that I am is enough. Take off your shoes for the place you're standing is holy ground. That's it. That's the burning bush moment. That's the moment where he recognized the divine was in his midst. And on the other side of it, there's dips, there's turns, there's recalculating moments. But listen, our story begins when we open our eyes and we recognize, I love this, that God engulfs the ordinary. God engulfs the ordinary. There's a, a great quote that I read this week. There's times I'm a, I'm a bit of a book nerd and I, if I get like a Kindle book because I travel and I don't want to take a lot of books with me, I'll still buy the hardback. I, I've got lots of books. I read a bunch of them at the same time. It drives my wife crazy, but it's just who I am. And, and I take a pen and if I'm reading a book, I, I underline quotes. I write them in the margins. And when I find something really incredible, I get all crafty and I write it on a business card and I take a picture of it and I send it to the media team and I say, hey, I wanna share this with the Harvest community. Here's the quote that I found this week that I loved. Elizabeth Browning, listen to what she said. Earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoe. Stop and let that settle in. Ooh, earth is crammed with heaven. Come on, can we be honest with each other? How many of you got a junk drawer in your house? Come on, you know that drawer. You like, do you want your guests to open that up? You know? Because maybe you got the organizer and the batteries go here and oh, the pins are gonna go here all nice and stuff. I see you whispering to each other. You're like, yeah, we got that junk drawer, right? And you eventually, like you can't even open it. There's so, yo, oh, guests are coming, great. Shove it in the junk drawer. So that like you can't even budge, it's so crammed. Like think about that in context to how God works in our lives. Earth is crammed with heaven. And every bush, every ordinary thing that we see around us is a fire with the blaze of God, but only he who truly sees takes off his shoes. Like, what I love about this is the reminder that I believe the divine is just speaking and alive and reveal, God's revealing himself to us every single day. The question is, are we looking? There's this, there's this thing called inattentional blindness. I don't know if you've heard of it, but by definition, when I saw this this week, I went, well, that's good. It's an event in which an individual fails to experience an unexpected stimulus in plain sight. Inattentional blindness. It's when there's something amazing that's happening and you miss it because you're more caught up in the ordinary inattentional blindness. 
You know, I do marriage ministry, and a part of that, I mean, being a pastor on this staff, I do a few weddings a year, and I love weddings, I do. I, I love the moment when I'm standing there at the front of the church, and the groom, I get to walk in with the groom, and he's standing right there, and he's trying not to lock his knees and throw up and pass out, and he's sweating a lot, and then the bride comes in, and everybody's watching the groom, and they're up there and in front of me, and I don't know why I think I gotta give them a message. They're not listening to me. They're giggling, and they're laughing at each other, which is amazing. They're caught up in just the awe. They pursued each other, and there's the moment, man, and the wedding night is coming, and the honeymoon is there, and, and it's all new, and it's exciting, and, and there's new adventures, and then the Babies come, praise the Lord, and babies have that like new baby smell. Isn't it amazing? And it only lasts though for just a month or two, and then babies get a different smell, and, and it's not a new baby smell, and, and all of a sudden it just, marriage gets a little tough, right? And a year could turn into five years, which could turn into 10 years, which I pray it turns into 20 and 25 and 30. But inattentional blindness in a marriage is when you stop pursuing each other. It's when you stop that relationship, stop seeing the new, the amazing that God has placed in your life. Whatever inattentional blindness is to you, it's losing the extraordinary and instead choosing to dwell on the ordinary in your lives. We could call it spiritual blindness. It's that moment that you give your life to Christ and it's that moment that you recognize that you've got a name, that God is here, that God is calling you to do extraordinary things but all of a sudden that new car smell wears off and you go, God, I'll give you an hour on Sunday but that's about all I got for you because I got a busy week ahead. And I feel like every day God fires off burning bushes. Every day there's someone in your office that needs to hear good news. Every day there's someone that you encounter in the street who needs to be seen. Every day God, the divine, is firing off these burning bushes to just show us the miraculous. The question is, are we seeing them? The early Celtic Christians, you know what they called it? I love this. The idea of the divine in our midst, they called it, they defined it, thin places, thin places. Thin places are those moments where earth and heaven smack together and you stand amidst the shroud of just seeing the glory of God in everyday life. So how do you get there? How do you wake up? to the greater world that's happening around us, like to, to, to see the extraordinary in the midst of the ordinary. I mean, right? I don't think Moses will ever look at a bush again. How many times did he have to go back to this one bush to remind him of the extraordinary, of the promises that God made? How many times do you think Balaam actually went back and corrected a donkey? I don't think he ever did. Never looked at a donkey the same way again. Where did Jesus find Simon, James, and John? They're holding their nets at the side of a shore and there in the midst of the ordinary, mundane task of just fishing, Jesus would change that and they would become fishers of men. What about Matthew? He's a tax collector despised by the religious people, but yet Jesus would see him when the rest of culture looked over him, saw the worst in him. Jesus said, I see you, and I see the potential that you have the ability to do what I'm doing, so follow me. And there, in the midst of the mundane and the ordinary, the extraordinary just revealed itself. So how do you do it? I think Paul, in the book of Romans, gives us a really good insight here. Let me share this with you. Uh, it's Romans chapter 12, and, and I wanna read this from the message version because I love the way the message reads this particular passage of, of scripture. Sometimes I change the translations and it just speaks in a different way. Listen to what Paul says here in Romans 12. Here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping you're eating, you're going to work, and you're walking around life, and you place it before God as an offering. Take the mundane, take the ordinary. You brush your teeth twice a day, you brush them for the glory of God. You're a photocopier, that's what you do. You copy photos, that, whatever it is, you do it for the glory of God. You see and you invite God into everything that you do. Take your bodies and you offer them 
as offerings to God, holy and pleasing to God. He says, embracing what God does for you, it's the best thing you can do for him. And then he says this, pay attention, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking, but instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and then respond to it, unlike the culture around you that's always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. But God, God brings out the best from you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So here's your assignment for this week. Seek out those thin places that God places in your path, I believe, every single day. Wake up and then say these three words. Surprise me, God. And then pay attention. Look for those opportunities as you go about your day to see where burning bushes may arise and then be brave and find the extraordinary in the midst of the ordinary. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's people said, amen, amen.